Hi, I'm Dan Sear of Daniel's Training Services, and I provide training and consulting services for the management of waste, but also for the transportation of hazardous materials. In this video, we will be looking at the combustible liquid exception of the U.S. Department of Transportation for their hazardous materials regulations. Okay, so let's get right into that. Um, but before we do, a couple disclaimers, a couple things here. First off, this video is only a, a brief overview and summary of some pretty complex regulations. So if you look at this video and you're like, hey, yeah, that might work for me, well, then you have to do more research. I have articles that I've written on this subject much more in depth. There will be links to them in the description. Okay, so you can refer to them and also look at the regulations and of course contact me if you have any other questions. Okay, so a um, couple other things. The regulations change over time. So check the date of this video. If it's really, really old, you might want to double check and just make sure these regulations are even still in effect. But I don't see this particular regulation going anywhere anytime soon. Um, also, of course, don't rely entirely on this video, okay? Do the additional research, read my articles, check the regulations, contact me, you know, contact your EHS department, uh, contact the USDOT, do your research before you proceed on to make sure you're in compliance. And I have my standard disclaimer video, should be a link to it right up there. You can click on that if you wanna see that. Okay, a couple things now about the scope and the applicability of uh, this particular presentation. We will just be looking at the domestic regulations of the U.S. Department of Transportation. So that is just for the transportation to, from, or anywhere through the U.S., okay? That's number one. We won't be looking at international regulations here. And um, we are just going to be looking at the combustible liquid exception. Now, in an earlier video, I talked about flammable liquids and combustible liquids and how you can reclass a flammable liquid to a combustible liquid, all right? So this video is kind of picking up from there and looking at, okay, now you've got a combustible liquid, what can you do with it? What are your options under the combustible liquid exception, all right? So if you're interested, I do have a video earlier that I looked at the class three flammable and combustible liquid and reclassing your flammable liquid to a combustible liquid. Okay, why would, we do, why would we do this? What's the point of all this? Taking advantage of the combustible liquid exception can save you money. Boom, that's it, okay? So if you're gonna do it, if you can take advantage of it, if it's applicable to you, you could be looking at saving a lot of money on your transportation related costs. Um, including things like packaging, okay? So I'll be pointing that out as we go through. Okay, so basically there are two options under the combustible liquid exception, all right? Option one, the best one. If your combustible liquid is in a non-bulk packaging, okay? Now, for our sake here, a non-bulk packaging for a liquid has a capacity of 450 liters or less, all right? 119 gallons to us in the US. But if you have any packaging with a capacity of 119 gallons or less, that's a non-bulk packaging, okay? Like this guy here, clearly this is a non-bulk packaging. So you got your non-bulk packaging and it is not a hazardous waste, and it's not a reportable quantity of a hazardous substance, and it's not a marine pollutant. Okay, now there's more in all of that. You have to do some more research there, but if it's in a non-bulk packaging, not a hazardous waste, not a marine pollutant, not a reportable quantity of a hazardous substance, then you're done. And it's not subject to the USDOT hazmat regulations at all, okay? That is one form, one option of the combustible liquid exception. And that's actually how this guy was transported. This actually would be a flammable liquid, but it was reclassed to a combustible liquid. And then 
because it's in a non-bulk packaging and it's not a hazardous waste, not a reportable quantity of a hazardous substance, not a marine pollutant, and it's being transported within the U.S. by highway or rail, okay, according to our domestic regulations, then this is not subject to the regulations at all. And this little, I'm going to show you just in just a moment here, a close-up of the language in here that states that, okay, so you can take a look at that. Okay, that is option one, right? The best one. Is there anything else? Yes, option two. Not so good, but still a lot of, of uh, saving money on this one as well. If you have a combustible liquid that is in a bulk packaging, okay, so that's a packaging with a capacity of greater than 450 liters or 119 gallons, okay? Greater than that or any one of the following. It's a hazardous waste, it's a reportable quantity of a hazardous substance, or it's a marine pollutant, okay? So any one of those four things, you cannot take advantage of that really great combustible liquid exception, but we still get an exception from the regulations, all right? Now, the following remains. You still must have your hazmat shipping paper. So got to fill that out, complete it, sign it, all of that you still have to have all the required package marks. So we're talking identification number, proper shipping name, name of the shipper or receiver, all of that. You still have to have the identification number displayed on bulk packagings as required by the regs. You would still need the placards if it's on a bulk packaging. So there is a combustible liquid placard you would need to use. Um, there are additional regulations if it is going to be transported by aircraft or vessel. We're not going to get into that here. We're just staying on the ground. Okay. Um, there are requirements for reporting hazmat incidents if one occurs during transportation. That still remains. There are some of the basic packaging requirements of, of the hazmat regulations, uh, those sorts of things. Um, Non-bulk packaging, so again, combustible liquid under this option two, what I'm calling it, this not-so-good combustible liquid exception, if it's in a non-bulk packaging, it still must be a DOT specification or a UN standard packaging. And those cost more, all right? So under the second combustible liquid exception, in a non-bulk packaging, you would still need to have DOT specification or UN standard packaging. So that's not so great, but we're not done. You also would still need to provide hazmat employee training, and that's what I do, okay? Um, you would still need to provide emergency response information, and you would still uh, need to register as a shipper or a carrier if applicable, and there's requirements for the, all of the registration. So all of that would remain, and you might be thinking, well, this doesn't sound like much of an exception at all. That doesn't sound that great. So what do you get an exception from? Well, you don't need hazmat labels, okay? So hazmat labels would not be required on a non-bulk packaging under this combustible liquid exception. Um, there would not be placards required on the vehicle uh, if, the vehicle is only transporting non-bulk packagings, okay? So another bit of a break there on placards. And then here is what I think the big one. If your combustible liquid is in a bulk packaging, think of an IBC or a cargo tank or a portable tank, something like that. If it's in a bulk packaging, it does not have to be a DOT specification or a UN standard packaging. And that could be a big money saver right there, okay? Because typically your DOT specification, your UN standard packaging is going to cost you more. And so if you ship a lot of combustible liquid, taking advantage of this exception here in a bulk packaging, you could save yourself a lot of money on your packaging costs, okay? And that's really it. There are those two options, right? Under the combustible liquid exception, if you choose to take advantage of them. And you can reduce your regulatory burden 
and you can save money okay on packaging costs and perhaps transportation costs and other things like that now again if, if you looked at this and you're like hey yeah maybe that might work for us please continue your research okay read my articles links in the description all right um research the regulations contact me with questions i can talk you through it do your research and if you can take advantage of the combustible liquid exception then that's great okay um so again i uh, hope you enjoyed the video and uh please subscribe to my channel of course please like this video and share it with others and um, always contact me if you have a question or a need for training thank you very much